And I'm a very angry man, right, uh, young man, at the time that this passage takes place. Uh, you know, partly because my father is absent, partly because I'm trying to struggle, what does it mean exactly to be a black man in, an Amer in America? Uh, partly because I'm sufficiently isolated in Hawaii without a large African American community, without uh, father figures around that might guide me and steer my anger. Uh, what I end up relying on are the images and stereotypes that are coming through the media. And, and I'm having to patch together and piece together exactly what it means for me to, uh, uh, to be both African and an American. So the passage that I'm going to read right now takes place right after a party. Uh, and what's happened is, is that typically when I went to parties in high school, oftentimes there were three or four black people in a room of 300. Uh, so finally, a black friend of mine and myself decided to invite some white friends to a black party out in an army base, uh, out in uh, Schofield Barracks, one of the major army bases in Hawaii. And we immediately sense that they're a little uncomfortable being in this minority situation. Uh, you know, they're sort of trying to tap their foot to the beat. You know, and they're, they're you know, uh, being extraordinarily friendly. And uh, after a while, they decide, after about half an hour, they say, well, Barack, let's, let's get going. Uh, you know, we're feeling kind of tired. We're feeling this or that. And suddenly, th this sense that uh, what I have had to put up with every day of my life uh, is something that they find uh, so objectionable that they can't even put up with it for a day. And these are good friends of mine and, and, and uh, 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 folks who, who had uh, stood by me for many years. Uh, it, it, something is triggered in my head. And by the time I had dropped my friends off, I had begun to see a new map of the world, one that was frightening in its simplicity, suffocating in its implications. We were always playing on the white man's court, Ray had told me, by the white man's rules. If the principal or the coach or a teacher or Kurt wanted to spit in your face, he could because he had power and you did not. If he decided not to, if he treated you like a man or came to your defense, it was because he knew that the words you spoke, the clothes you wore, the books that you read, your ambitions and desires were already his. Whatever he decided to do, it was his decision to make, not yours. And because of that fundamental power he held over you, because it preceded and would outlast his individual motives and inclinations, any distinction between good and bad whites held negligible meaning. In fact, you couldn't even be sure that everything you had assumed to be an expression of your black unfettered self, the humor, the song, the behind the back pass, had been freely chosen by you. At best, these things were a refuge. At worst, a trap. Following this maddening logic, the only thing you could choose as your own was withdrawal into a smaller and smaller coil of rage, until being black meant only the knowledge of your own powerlessness and your own defeat. And the final irony, should you refuse this defeat and lash out at your captors, they would have a name for that too, a name that could cage you just as good, like paranoid or militant, or violent, or nigger. <laughs>